Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Framework Podcast. I'm one of your two co-hosts, Ana Trujillo-Limon, joined by Jamie Hopkins, and today we're really excited to chat with Diego Verdugo. Diego, thanks so much for taking some time for us today on Framework. No, thank you for, for the invite. It's, uh, it's quite the honor, and uh, I know I'm in the presence of two legends here, so uh, I'll try not to, not to get too, uh, too anxious. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> not legends, just just mere humans. <laughs> so I, I say Anna's like... an icon now. So yeah, she she loves that I, part. So I don't. I just see like I get red. I don't dig it at all. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> so Diego, we always like to kick off the show by asking about your current favorite food or your favorite food obsession that, that you you've got going on right now. What do you? What is that for you right now? Oh man, that's that's a tough question. Uh, I am a foodie. I, w- I would start with that. Um, you know, my, uh, my, uh, fiance would say that I probably eat, uh, way too much more than I should, but, uh, you know, so far I can, uh, I can get away with it. We'll see 10, five years from now. Uh, but, uh, so I was born and raised in Mexico, uh, Jamie and Anna and, uh, uh Northern state uh, of Sonora, which is just right South of Arizona. So, uh, as you can imagine, Mexican food is, is close to heart and we actually, cook uh, quite a bit at home. And I actually follow you, Jamie, on, uh, I follow both of you, obviously, on social media, but I know, Jamie, that you like to, to cook uh, quite a bit. And so I always get inspired by, by your recipes there and some of the things that you're posting. But uh, uh, so again, Mexican food, and, and I would say probably tacos, I would put tacos at the top of the list. And uh, in Sonora, uh, just for, for your benefit here, for the two of you, uh, carne asada is a big thing, right? So you can think of it just, you know, grilling, uh, mostly flank steak, I would say, and then you know we'll make a, a side block. Uh, we'll chop some onion, cilantro, and mm-hmm. put that right on top of the uh, flour tortillas, uh, and uh, you know just uh, some some homemade uh, roasted salsa. And that's you know if I could eat that for you know lunch, uh, breakfast, and, and dinner, I would be happy. That's that awesome. Delicious. <laughs> I, I have I have right now in the other room. I haven't made it before but i am trying it so in omaha they have whiskey marinated steaks so they wet age them and so i have four steaks that i am wet aging in a mixture of whiskey and like worcestershire and some other stuff so Ah. i have no i have no idea how these are going to turn out but the steak like coloring has significantly changed (laughs) so i do not know (laughs) but like looking at them i'm like well they've changed color so that's something something has occurred (laughs) well you're really i was gonna say you're willing to try new things right i think that's uh that's the important part with with cooking right and so uh funny story i actually almost went to culinary school before going to business school so uh you know that's where that comes from we're definitely going to talk about that then. So <laughs> that, I mean, I'm going to change up the order of the questions because, um, so you wanted to go to culinary school. So tell us what, first of all, did, is that what you wanted to be when you were little growing up? Um, or what did you want to be when you were little and how did you get to this profession? Yeah. Yeah. So I certainly didn't think that I would end up in, in financial services. I'll tell you that. Um, you know, and I think that is, that seems to be kind of the norm, right? For most people that end up uh, working in our, in our industry, it seems like at least lately, uh, but no, I, uh, you know, I, I always knew that I wanted to go to college and, uh, you know, I come from a, uh, a family who's, you know, first of all, my parents didn't even finish elementary schools themselves. They had to work at a very early age. Uh, I'm the youngest of four, uh, brothers and we have a, uh, we have a younger sister. Um, but I would say, you know, even when we're still back in Mexico, you know, college was, was, you know, but a dream at that point. And so, um, it wasn't so much about what I wanted to do. It was, you know, me hoping that I would get the uh, fortune to actually go to college and graduate with a degree more than anything. Um, so that being said, uh, when my family moved to the U.S. in uh, around 2001, I would say I was maybe 10, 11 years old at the time. Um, you know, I, again, I was to a certain extent knew that I had to go to college to, you know, in general improve uh, my life and the life of my family, the lives of my family. So. Uh, at that point, I actually kind of my kind of had my eyes set set on uh, computer science, ironically. So, and uh, had a great. Uh, so, you know, maybe, let me let me maybe take a step back. So, school always came. I wouldn't say easy to me, but certainly easier than than other things. And so, uh, it was it was almost like my ticket out of out of that life, right? Uh, and, and just you know, as my parents uh, came out here pursuing the American dream. 
uh, one, I had made uh, or I had seen my, my siblings make, make uh, some mistakes along the way. Like they tried the community college thing, dropped out and just decided to work. Right. And so I figured, OK, you, you don't have a choice. You're going to have to be, you know, the one to, to kind of break, you know, some of these barriers and and uh, take it upon yourself to, uh, to to, you know, make something of yourself. And so um, with that being said, once when I, once I actually graduated from middle school, went into high school, I made sure that I got you know some pretty good grades so that hopefully down the line I would qualify for for scholarships, right? And so that's uh, essentially what ended up happening. Happening on uh, and, and Jamie, I uh, got almost a full ride to a private liberal arts school in Iowa, uh, uh, Mount Vernon, Iowa, which is about uh, two hours east of of the capital there, Des Moines. And uh, so you know at that point everything changed, as you can imagine, right? But uh, going back to your question, Anna, um, so throughout high school, uh, and, and it's funny because it's, it's sort of connected to the favorite food question, right? Because I was a foodie, I was trying to get creative in terms of, you know, how can I maybe do something that I like and maybe, you know, at the same time get fed. And so <laughs> I actually joined our culinary arts program in the high school that I went to uh, uh, in Douglas, Arizona. Shout out to to our Bulldogs there, Douglas High School. Uh, they had a very good uh, culinary arts program. And so I just joined because, hey, you know, oh, that's pretty cool. You get to 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 cook during school days and then you get to eat the food afterwards. So selfishly, that was the reason why I joined the, the, the program. Uh, but it ended up being actually a college prep program for those that wanted to go on to pursue um you know, culinary arts uh, degree. And ironically, we actually had a remodeled kitchen and everything sort of commercial grade. And so, you know, I got a chance to, to you know, do some some legit cooking in that kitchen. And then from there, my uh, my high school teacher came to me and said, well, why don't you, uh, you know, maybe uh, represent us uh, for a program that's out there called, uh, I think it's called uh, Careers Through Culinary Arts Program, CCAP. And so I joined the program uh, and it was actually a national program. And uh, I ended up, believe it or not, competing uh, and representing the state of Arizona here. Uh, and I think I even got a scholarship my senior year. I think it was for like $6,000. And I think that the top three people actually got full rides. Now, again, going back to your question, I never really saw myself doing that as an, as an actual career or a job. It was just me, you know out there having fun and skipping class so that I could go compete and, <laughs> and, you know, getting to, to, you know, go around, uh, literally travel and, and stay at hotels. And, uh, you know, when you come from a, a place like I came from, uh, Anna and, and Jamie, that's, that was, that was quite a bit, right. That was, that was, that was pretty nice to, to just come out there and, uh, you know, again, skip class and, and still get, uh, you know, uh, or live through a, a wonderful experience. And so, but that being said today, uh, I try to cook as much as possible. My uh, fiance would say that I don't cook enough. She does most of the cooking, but uh, but I love it, you know, and I just, I like having fun with it. Well, cool. if you ended up on like Beat Bobby Flay, what would be the one dish you would pick <laughs> to challenge him in? Oh, no doubt tacos, man. I think, uh, you know, or some sort of Mexican dish, right? I think that, uh, uh, you know, th there's certain things that, that you come with in your culture that, you know, that, that, that spice, that touch, that I'm sure both of you can relate to, right? For maybe generational recipes that have been handed down mm -hmm. uh, to you. And, you know, you can't just go to school and learn that, right? You can even no. working at a restaurant, right? Whatever, some touches you just you just have, right? So I think, you know, it's funny because now when we have our friends over or maybe coworkers or even clients that I send, sometimes end up cooking for, uh, you know, that's usually my go-to. We'll make some carne asada tacos. We'll make some, again, roasted, uh, you know, green chili uh, salsa. We'll make some guac you know, everything handmade and they just, you know, they, they fall in love with it. So I think we, we're doing something right, I suppose. <laughs> I love that. The aspect of like, you can't really teach like what we make and, and the That's culture. Right. Like I, I saw this meme the other day that was like, I, the way I cook is not like my mom wrote down recipes. It's like, I just cook <laughs> and like, until the ancestor tell me, yeah, mija, yeah. <laughs> like enough already with that spice. That's, that's enough. <laughs> but I love That's that. That's right. <laughs> That's right. You bring up a great point, Anna. So in, in Mexican culture, Jamie, you know, when you try to get a recipe from your mother, right, or your aunt or your abuelita or what have you, they're like, oh, you know, just a little bit, just a touch, you know, un poquito is what they say. And, you know, so you end up, uh, you know, almost... Uh, uh, taking chances there when you're cooking and experimenting. But, you know, I think that's what gives you that, uh, again, right, that chef, that uh, uh, special touch, I suppose, with every dish. Yeah, I, I like how the grandparents don't always pass everything down fully. 
<laughs> my grandfather's he makes a salad and he like hides it from everybody. So like when he's making it, he kind of blocks in case people are in the kitchen looking at him when he's making it. So, you know, I can get close, but you know, it's not quite the same. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So Diego, another fun question we like to ask is, um, what was your first money memory? Oh, another great question. Jeez. Um, I've had a lot, I guess, over the years, but uh, I guess there's one that's it's kind of close to my heart. And that is, so growing up, uh, you know, it was, it was not uncommon for for us to try to work and support our parents. And when I say us, I'm talking about my siblings and I. And I remember, um, geez, this must have been 20 years ago, uh, 15, 20 years ago, uh, my dad got laid off from um, from his job. At the time, he was working at some sort of tomato uh, uh, greenhouse or factory down in, in southeastern Arizona. And, you know, this happened shortly after we had just moved to the U.S., and so I remember him, you know, our family struggling financially and, and, you know, them trying to figure out how to make ends meet. And, uh, you know, my father was always a great gardener and landscaper. And so, uh, you know, just kind of pitched the idea to him to go out there and try to see if we could, you know, find some some yards and, and do the landscapings for, for some people out there, and, and again, in Douglas. And uh, he was intimidated at first because, because, one, he didn't speak the language. Um, and two, he had never really, you know, worked on his own. He was always, you know, to a certain extent employed for and, and working for somebody else. Anyway, he ended up taking the, uh, uh, the chance, I suppose. And, uh, on the weekends, I actually used to go help him. And I tell people that when, um, when we had sort of a good weekend, meaning we actually worked maybe let's just say Friday evening, Saturday, all day, and then Sunday, all day uh, and, and really we would go out there before the sun came out and we would leave until we couldn't see anything right so uh, but I remember when we had a good weekend he would give me uh, $30 and uh, when we didn't he would give me $20 and of course you know I was I was very young at the time but I always you know was kind of hoping oh man I hope this is a good weekend so that I can actually get the $30 um, and then my mom, uh, Anna and Jamie, she actually had a grocery store business in Mexico. And so even when we moved to the U.S., because we lived in a border town, uh, my mother actually kept that business. My parents kept that business and they were leasing it. Uh, but, you know, when they had that business, uh, my mom used to also lend people money. You could think of it almost like a like a pawn shop type operation in addition to the grocery store. So we grew up watching my mom doing a lot of different things, lending people money. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, people used to come in and she would make food for them. Anything that, you know, would basically allow her to make uh, a few bucks so that she could support my dad. And so I, I remember always watching her uh, and, and seeing her, you know, make $3 out of one right? Or, 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 or so, so on and so forth. And so when I would get those 20, $30, I would save them. And then eventually ended up saving, like, I want to say $200. And I actually lent uh, somebody those $200 and I charged them, I think it was like 30% interest, which sounds mind blowing, right? Uh, but, uh, but I ended up making those two, you know, $200 uh, into maybe, I don't know, three, $400, which, you know, when you're 10, 15 years old, that's, that's a big deal. And so, you know, kind of a, a long story there to get to to one of those memories but uh you know to a certain extent i guess i you know was was getting a uh, uh, uh at least an initiation into finance at that point right yeah the entrepreneurial spirit from the that's right. beginning yeah <laughs> that's right that's right i want to uh, uh, kind of point out something that's really cool diego you do a really good job at it so it's just like a hey congrats on doing a good job <laughs> with that you're really really good at um saying our names back and it's uh it's a thing that you know i, I read about i don't always do it that well but it like endears you to people right it creates connection but you're really good mm -hmm. at it. you've done it like every time you answer you're always like anna and jamie you know, and then you go into it. it's really cool. <laughs> but, you know, not a lot of people do it. So it's it's a very cool thing. And I don't think it's, you're it's, consciously thinking about it every time anymore either. Right. You probably just no. You're, you're spot on. <laughs> you're spot on. And, and uh, I know Anna's passionate about that type of thing. And, and I am as well. Right. It's uh, it's it's very important that people, first of all, uh, you know, connect with you on a personal level uh, as much as possible and try to relate to you. But names are so crucial. 
right? And in every culture, and it's, you know, whenever I try, whenever I meet somebody, I actually take a step back and I'm like, okay, first of all, how do you say your name? Uh, am I saying it right? So, and I, and I feel like I'm terrible with names at times. I'm better with faces, but, uh, but it's, it's so important, right? I think that, uh, uh, you know, if you're able to make those personal connections and, and if you care that, uh, you want to pronounce somebody's name correctly, uh, that says a lot. So like you said, Jamie, I think now it just comes up, it just comes uh, naturally, but, uh, but I know I care when people say my name, when people address me personally the way I, I, I like to be addressed. So, uh, you know, I would only think that others think the same or hope to, to have the same with them. I bet that helps the client relations too, interacting with clients and stuff. <laughs> Certainly. Absolutely. Yeah. Nobody ever asked me. Every nobody time. asked you. Nobody ever name. asked me. No, <laughs> we went over this before. <laughs> They could just, everybody could be getting it wrong. Maybe I do go by Jaime, and it just literally <laughs> hurt out. Who's to say? <laughs> Did you yeah, ever people... have one of those uh, Spanish names, uh, Jamie, when you ha- were taking maybe a Spanish class? Well, it is Jaime. That's, it is. It is I was going to say, yeah. In, yeah. It's spelled the same way, too. So it's not, yeah. That's, yeah, that was, uh, and, and there were people that called me Jaime, but just because that's how it was spelled. And I that's don't right. Really, so, like, oddly enough, I don't have as much connection to, like, I don't, I didn't like my name when I was younger. Mm. So like, I really don't care if everybody would get it wrong forever. Like it would not <laughs> matter to me um, because it was a, uh, people used to say oh, it was a girl's name. So like kids would tease you for having mm. a girl's name mm. and I have super curly hair when it's wrong. And then they would say I have girl's hair because all their grandmothers <laughs> would have perms. And yep, then I yep. swam and then swimming was kind of a girl's sport. But none of those things really bothered me that much either because I live with only girls and I was like, yeah, that's cool. Like. <laughs> That's just normal, say, right? Eventually, that probably <laughs> that probably helped out, right? <laughs> yeah, but uh, I didn't love my name, but now I do. Yeah, it's a good name. There you go. There you go. <laughs> I love my name, and I hate when people say Anna. Like I, I try to correct <laughs> right. unless like I'm never gonna see them again. I'm like, okay, they'll call me Anna. That's fine mm-hmm. one time. But like when people call me Anna Maria, like my full name, I'm like, I think I'm in trouble because my mom would always <laughs> call me that when I was in trouble. Oh, like, yeah. uh oh, so please don't call me Anna Maria. That scares me. I don't like it. <laughs> Even a, though it's a beautiful a very name. Common thing. Yeah, my yeah. middle name is Armando. So yeah, my mom would just say Diego Armando, and you know, you oh, know, yeah. I knew I was in trouble. So <laughs> yep. For sure. So um, back back when you were making all that money and interest, what was your first big purchase? That's another thing I'm always curious about. <clears throat> yeah, great, great question. So uh, I would say clothes, you know, I think maybe clothes, shoes, um, you know, I was, it's it's interesting now that I'm older, and, and I certainly don't think that I'm as, as materialistic as maybe let's just say other people. I think that helped out because I, I always remember just wanting to help my parents, right? Very much like my siblings would do. Uh, but because, you know, there was, there, we were in, in, in a home with, with four boys and my, uh, our sister's much younger than us. We actually, uh, uh, our sister came into our lives, uh, uh, you know, when I was already, you know, eight, nine, uh, years old. Uh, so I was, I was much older and I, no, I take that back anyway. Uh, she's much younger than us, but, um, so why do I say that? Because, uh, essentially what happened in my family and this is very common in Mexican culture, Jamie, is that. If you have older siblings, you end up with, you know, your older siblings close, right? Just being <laughs> passed down. And keep in mind, yes. I was the youngest of four guys. And I was, you know, the, the skinny sort of grumpy kid. And of course, you know, when, uh, you know, my brothers would hand over, uh, hand over their clothes to me, I would be flying in those clothes, right? And so I always told my mom, hey, you know, I want my own shoes. I want my own clothes. And so whenever I actually got my hands on some money, uh, I actually would, whatever, right? Just buy a new pair of shoes or, or tell my, just give my mom the money and actually buy me my own, my own clothes. Um, but I do remember on our, uh, uh, our, our mom got us a, a piano once for, for Christmas. And that was probably, I would say maybe from a materialistic standpoint, uh, that was, you know, like a, one of our favorite, uh, presents. And she actually got us one for the, for all of us, right? It's not like we were each going to get, uh, a Christmas gift. She just bought this this big piano, and and we would all use it. So I guess you know maybe from that standpoint, more more of an item versus you know an experience. I I've, I've always been about experiences, and and so uh, even when when we used to go buy those clothes, we would actually go as a family, and um, once a, once a year or so, Jamie. Uh, again, very much part of the Mexican culture. Uh, you know, our our parents would get us together. 
and and we actually had visas uh, to to cross into the U.S. and so we we actually lived in a border town. Uh, so about once a year, our family would take the four of us to to the store so that we could get clothes for the year. And it's funny because I share with people that. Um, you know, it's not like you had your soccer cleats. It's not like you had your, you know, school shoes and your dress shoes. We all got one pair of shoes and you would use, those, you know, that pair of shoes uh, to play soccer. You would use that to go to school. You'd use that to go out. So, uh, yeah, you know, just funny things like that. I love that. I had two older sisters and an older brother, but like part of that in terms of getting their clothes, I would love to like, oh, I love that outfit. I can't wait till it's mine or that skirt's yeah. nice. I'm going to wear that. I'm going to yep. really rock that one day. <laughs> yeah. I and, love you that. Know, with, with four guys, it was a little more aggressive, Anna. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was, it was like, hey, you know, that's my shirt. Don't you dare wear that again. It was very much like that. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Yeah, I had I, I didn't get as much because I, I was the oldest of five, but I did have two mm. cousins and a lot of their stuff passed to me. But I re I remember getting two pretty cool things from them, too. So I would also get right like sporting yeah. equipment, like old baseball helmets, stuff like that. We get passed mm -hmm. down. But I did get a skateboard once. So one of my cousins got a new skateboard and gave me his, which was like I think one of only three skateboards I ever owned came from him. Mm -hmm. And I did end up getting their Super Nintendo. So that was the big one. Oh, there one. you go. Yeah, because they got like whenever, or I guess Nintendo. When Super Nintendo came mm -hmm. out, they gave me their Nintendo. And uh, like that was that was huge, right? Because we just deal, didn't right? have one. Yeah, that was a big deal. And, uh, you know, yeah, my cousins, Matt and Brian. <laughs> um, yeah, I didn't really, I don't remember caring too much about the clothes. But, uh, yeah. you know. Yeah, the, uh, the those were two really cool things that got passed down to me that I was pretty happy about. But uh, the experience thing is cool. So do you have a favorite experience you've had um, that you've like gone on or done or it, it, like immediately when I just say that something probably comes to mind? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, again, growing up, uh, certainly, you know, we faced a lot of financial challenges. Right. And so. Uh, in our family, it's not like, you know, my dad used to work, uh, you know, typically manual labor. My mom was always kind of running the grocery store. And then, you know, we would help help out however we could. And so, uh, you know, it's not like we were doing, you know, we, we weren't at the bottom of the spectrum by any means, but we weren't also, you know, the family's taking vacations every year or, you know, driving nicer cars or having the best house sort of in the neighborhood. Uh, it was mostly, you know, we were just you know, maybe I would say low to middle income uh, back in Mexico at the time. And, uh, you know, for example, food, you know, was always there, right, because of the grocery store. Uh, but I remember because we didn't really have the money, uh, Jamie and Anna, to go on vacations, um, our vacation was actually going down uh, to a, a small town in Mexico that was about an hour, 45 minutes out, just south of, of, of the city there that we grew up in, which is also a little town. But, you know, we would go to a smaller town where uh, my fam, my, my parents' uh, family was from, where, where he had been raised. And uh, again, this was only like a 45 minute drive, one hour drive. Um, but, you know, we were literally, you know, in the country, right up in the Sierra in, in Sonora. And so uh, that was, you know, we remember always just having a blast when we would go down there and we come from a pretty big family. So there's maybe, you know, 40 cousins uh, between all of us. And so uh, maybe even more than that. And so our best, uh, you know, I would say the, the best vacation memories that I have uh, was actually driving down there for, for example, for Easter weekend or, you know, just uh, summer or what have you. And we would just run around uh, the, the the small uh, house that uh, where my where my dad uh, was raised and where his his siblings were raised. Um, our 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 abuelitos, our grandparents, actually died uh, pretty young. So I want to say my, you know, it was it was just the oldest, uh, the older uh, uh, people, the older uh, siblings, and in, in, you know, in the family that actually got to meet them. Uh, but we had an uncle that that lived in that town, Esqueda, and he, he actually uh, has since passed away. He passed away about four years ago, and uh, he never married, had any kids or anything. But he was he was almost like our second dad, uh, Jamie and Anna. Uh, and so, um, uh, and I actually have a picture of him uh, uh, here, and I want to show it to you because the frame just broke, so I have to get a new a few frame. Uh, but this is our uncle Tony. Uh, and so, you know, very much a, a Mexican cowboy there, Jamie, for your reference. Mm -hmm. And um, 
and so anyway, our best memories were always going down to and, and visiting our, our Tio Tony and just spending time with him. And, you know, he had horses around and we would just run around, you know, the, the house. Uh, sometimes it would take us to, to a little ranch or a farm. And, you know, it was just the cousins out there uh, and, our, and, you know, my siblings just hanging out. Uh, you know, throwing, you know, ropes at each other and you name it, it was more of a farm type of life. But, uh, but those were, were blasts. And even though we didn't, again, have these fancy like beach vacations or anything, it was, it was always all about family and food. Right. And, and as long as we have family and food, we were, we were happy, happy kids. Oh, I love that. Are you both pretty good at riding horses? Anna? I don't know if we've ever talked <laughs> no. about this. No, I'm not. No. D- D- I'd like to think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have, uh, uh, we'll talk, maybe we'll talk about this, but we actually are trying to uh, start a cattle ranch down in Mexico. We have some cattle right now. We don't have our own ranch per se, but uh, we're trying to work on that. So it's fun. When I was growing up, we had a little, like, well, little, we had cows and we had a little tiny little ranch, um, but we mm-hmm. didn't have any horses. So we only had the cattle. So my, my grandfather, my, this is how my brother got so good at running is that when they have to drive the cattle to like, you know, go graze and stuff, my brother uh-huh. would have to run after them. And you have cowboy boots, he had like running <laughs> shoes. And so we'd have to hire actual cowboys to help, help <laughs> drive our cattle. But it, it was crazy. But no, I do not know, know how to ride a horse. I'm not good at it. And so <laughs> there's that um i've never been on a horse still no oh, there's okay, like yeah i i am not much of a, a cowboy growing up and now <laughs> living in dc baltimore and philadelphia so philly has a weird like urban cowboy culture thing yep. i don't know if you yeah so like not very many people are aware of it but like it's like a weird city and like you can keep horses in your backyard there like in no, like interesting. a yeah, like a 12 by 12 foot backyard, you can still have a horse there. And there's been a lot of issues because it's like a animal <laughs> care stuff is not great. But in North Philly, you'll literally like drive down a street and three see like three guys in like North Philly riding on horses down the street. Like it's a very interesting awesome. like subculture thing there. But yeah, I've never been on a horse. I've never shot a gun. And those so my cowboy days are like pretty mm, minimal. Okay. Yeah. East Coast yeah, cowboys are lacking. <laughs> you have to help him out then we have to get him on a horse yeah and get absolutely him to shoot a gun. I was say, there's there's plenty of of shooting that takes place in arizona and there's plenty of cowboy uh and in general western culture influence in in arizona in fact you know same thing with us our family uh you know it's that's that's big in our family in fact uh, you might see from the picture that it's it's back there we have a family picture with uh with our older daughter and uh and my fiance there uh, you know, with the cowboy uh, hats and everything, but uh, yeah, that's that's big here. And because, of course, we're trying to get into the uh, uh, sort of the ranching business, rancher business. Uh, not only is it almost a way of life for us, but now we're actually trying to have uh, you know the kids and the grandkids and the family to to also take that. Uh, and make sure that they're adopting that, right, and keeping that. Uh, I think I've, I think I heard somewhere it takes about uh, three generations or so on average for your, for for the you know those family members to you know lose the culture or be uh, significantly uh, uh, separated, right, from from culture. And we certainly don't want that to happen with with the grandkids and the family. We want to make sure that that uh, influence and 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 history, right, and context is is very much present. Uh, one, when they grow up and same thing with the businesses that we're trying to build uh, and starting that ranch, we want to make sure that we take the kids there and so that one, they get away from the screens as, as you know, that's a, a challenge for everyone. And, and Jamie, I know you're a, a, a parent as well, uh, but two, so that they also get to see and experience a little bit of the things that we uh, uh, went through right or saw when we were growing up. So. So Diego, speaking of your upbringing, I, I'm al- I'm always curious to hear how. Well, there are two two parts to this question. When when you told a story to Luis Rosa on his podcast, it was a very precious story about you going to college with your backpack full of tamales, and I just love that. <laughs> I just I loved that story so much. Yeah. But so incorporating that, and then everything you've told us about you know your growing up in Sonora, what how do you feel your unique upbringing yeah. has prepared you to do the work you do today? Oh, great question. So, and, and you, you sort of alluded to this, Anna, but 
you know, I grew up in, in, in a family where my mom was, was very entrepreneurial and she was actually very good at finance as well. And uh, uh, even though they never had the opportunity, both her and my dad, to actually go on to pursue higher education, uh, I have a lot of respect for everything that they were able to, to do and, and build uh, and, and how they got our family to, to live much better lives, right? First of all, in taking uh, a leap of faith and, and, and essentially leaving everything behind when they decided to come over to the U.S. Um, uh, but the reality is, is that because we saw them, you know, doing a lot of different things uh, when we were growing up, uh, you know, that, that always uh, kind of planted or that, that planted a seed. And I would say all of us, not just myself, but my siblings as well to say, you know, what else is out there? Right. And, and it's interesting because I think as I'm older now, uh, Anna and Jamie, I think that uh, I don't really want to be remembered. And I know maybe we'll get to this, but, uh, you know, we have our jobs. Right. And that's it's, it's what we do, but it's not necessarily who we are. Yeah. Right. And it's, of course, it's important to who we are. Uh, but in, in, because I saw my parents being a lot of different things, I very much want to make sure that, that I, you know, try to follow a similar path where, uh, you know, I work in financial services and I'm also now an entrepreneur, uh, but what else can I be doing? Right. Can I volunteer on a board? Can I, you know, teach financial literacy to kids, uh, you know, all these different things. And so, uh, even as I'm meeting with with uh, with our clients and with other financial professionals in the industry, um, Jamie and Anna, it's it's very important for me to look at how uh, you know how I can help solve the problems, right, and how I can help to produce outcomes uh, for for clients. And uh, I think that because I grew up in such a dynamic environment, uh, it was very much about solving problems, right. Sometimes we were uh, uh, maybe out of gas in Mexico. That's not very uh, uncommon, Jamie, uh, because you don't really have, you know, the gas, natural gas pipelines going, uh, uh, you know, under, under the, uh, uh, the ground there. You, it's, it's actually, you know, you have these cylinders, right? Very much like your, your grill cylinder and you just fill them up and, and, and that's what, you know, you used to cook and, and heat your home and, and what have you. So, uh, you know, some days we, there was just no money, right. To fill up those, those gas cylinders. So those gas cylinders. So what do you do, you know? And so, and then same thing with my mom, when she was running the business, uh, you know, maybe she needed to uh, stuck up and, and, uh, on a specific item, but, uh, you know, her provider wasn't available, right. Or, or what have you. So it was always, okay, you know, what can we do to solve this problem? And, you know, I can, I can say that, that, that now that I work in financial services, which is, of course, right, a much more mature industry and, uh, and, and we, we have a lot going on, you know, we're still solving problems, right? And we're still trying to uh, accomplish different outcomes for people. And, uh, you know, as, as I think about my upbringing, I, I would say that all those experiences that we had, both good and bad, certainly uh, made me have a more open mind and, and be able to maybe adapt uh, easily, right? And, and pivot whenever I, I do run into a hurdle. Uh, and, and, you know, I now sort of hope that I'm also passing that on to uh, the people that I work with, whether that's my colleagues or co-workers uh, or also our clients, because uh, there's never a straight path anywhere, right? Especially in this industry. And, and especially in a big organization, for example, like uh, like we have at Principal, I think we you know we maybe have closer to twenty thousand employees across the globe, and so it's uh, you know it's it certainly takes time to make decisions right and 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 think strategically, and then of course once you even make the decision, you got to execute and all these different things, and so again coming from that dynamic environment where we, we were always trying to figure out how to solve a problem or how to uh, make sure that the the bottom line. Uh, right was was where it should have been. Uh, that certainly carried over to to what I do now. If that makes sense, it does make a lot of sense. And you mentioned before we started recording, you were a couple of weeks ago. You were out in Philadelphia too uh, for an event. And I guess uh, I'd love to just get you know I, I, what what's something you got from that event, whether it's the community aspect or actually like a planning mm -hmm. topic that resonated with you but um i'm you know i'm always interested right when you travel you take time out of your life to go do something in this work side like what did you kind of take away from that yeah yeah great great question jamie uh well you know i would start with the caveat that i have uh, a newborn at home we have a newborn we have a four-month-old girl 
Uh, and then we have a five-year-old girl, two girls. So yeah. proud uh, girl dad is, is what I tell people. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a lot of work, right? And, and especially when you travel, Jamie, and I'm sure you can relate to this, uh, but even yourself, Anna, right? Uh, it's Travel is hard, right? Especially business travel where, you know, you may not get the sleep that you want. You may not be able to get that workout in. Uh, you may not be eating right. All these different things, right? And so it's it's certainly a grind. But, uh, but I would say on the plus side, Jamie, and you sort of alluded to this, uh, you get to meet people and, and, and learn from them, right? And you get to hear what's going on out there. And, uh, you know, you get to, to learn other perspectives from other people. And so that's what I value the most, I would say, with, with the business travel that I do. It's, you know, getting to interact with, I would say, the best and the brightest uh, in our industry. And then, of course, when I do get a chance to be also in front of clients, uh, even more so, right? Because, and I tell our colleagues in, in, in the industry this often, but I think we sometimes get lost, right? And, you know, the fee the funds of you know performance of this and that all the you know all the things that we deal with in, in financial services that we maybe sometimes forget that we work with people for people right and uh, they may not necessarily be as concerned as as against some of the things that I mentioned right but rather you know hey you know there's this fear of inflation that I have you know how does that impact me right all these different things uh, but I would say that one uh, maybe takeaway that I had, Jamie, is that um, it's 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 getting very difficult and, and much more challenging for financial professionals to do what they do. And what do I mean by that? Well, I think clients expect uh, you know financial professionals to do more and know more uh, than ever before, and uh, that's hard, right? Especially uh, you know if we think about the financial professional or the f financial profession as as sort of an entrepreneur, right, and being a business owner, you got to both run your business uh, efficiently and also be able to serve your clients, right, the way they want to be served. And so there's there's always a lot of conflicting priorities at play. And so if you have a more demanding uh, uh, client base now, it's 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 more more difficult for financial professionals to do everything that they need to be doing for the client and to do so in an objective and, and ethical way. And, uh, you know, I would say because of that, you know, I kind of came back and, and shared with my colleagues that uh, we need to be doing hopefully a better job at providing the support that financial professionals need, um, you know, to be able to serve their clients, uh, again, the way those clients expect to be served. And uh, with that being said, though, I think that uh, that also presents an opportunity, right, for, for professionals in our industry to make sure that they step up their game, that they are, you know, you know, I consider myself a, a lifelong learner and I'm very proud of that. Uh, um, you know, shout out to, to the CFP board. Uh, because those are the things that are going to make a difference, right? I think in, in our industry. And so, uh, but that was certainly a big takeaway, uh, Jamie, especially in being in front of uh, uh, the financial professionals there that, uh, you know, there's there's a lot more work that we need to, to, to be doing in terms of uh, providing, you know, better services and, and helping those clients again to, to, to solve those problems that I mentioned and, uh, and do so uh, in the best way possible. Yeah, you're wrapping your CFP board bit pin on here today. <laughs> yeah, right? I definitely saw that. <laughs> <laughs> and is that the CFP, your CFP? I can't read it behind you, but. Yeah, that's right. That is, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. Absolutely. And you, as you should be. <laughs> Anna, when you finish your MBA, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm framing it and I'm putting it right here. I'm saving there this well for it. <laughs> So I, I would year. say that is the most expensive frame I've ever bought on a, but you know, certainly, uh, uh, it, you know, I had to go with that because it, you know, the, the, the certification, uh, certainly deserved it. That's for sure. Absolutely. So I'm curious about your thoughts on, I know you're super involved. I know you're part of the Alfamilia and, you know, you're on the That's board right. there over there um, in Phoenix and you're part of FPA and, and I know you got a scholarship from principal as, as a student. So I'm curious mm -hmm. on, on two, so there's two parts to this question. One is what is the value of community, especially for like, you mm -hmm. know, up and coming young Latinos and Latinas and, and young people of color. Mm -hmm. And second, what, what is the value for companies investing in students the way principal invested in? you which you are still a loyal member of their organization so i'm, I'm curious um on those two aspects of, of that 
Great, great question, Anna, and uh, very much so. Principal has invested, uh, you know, their time, resources, uh, energy, focus, attention on me since the day I started working for them. In fact, I share the story that I got hired six months before I even graduated. Um, so I, I maybe didn't work as hard there towards the end of my uh, college career because I knew I had a job. But uh, you know, certainly a life-changing uh, opportunity, right? Um, Again, when you come from, uh, uh, you know, the, the place that I came from and sort of the, the background that I came from, uh, you know, when I got that offer, uh, I was already making maybe two times more than my father, would, you know, had ever made in his lifetime. And uh, I would say that's kind of where, you know, it's, it's one thing to know that you want to go to college, right, and you want to get a, a, a good paying job. But when you actually get that offer, right, from your first employer, and you know that you're going to be getting a paycheck, uh, that changes your life, right? And, and and that was one of the moments where, you know, I look back and I said, you know what, this is why my parents left. This is, you know, Mexico. This is why I went to school. This is why, why I made sure that, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time, energy and attention into my studies uh, so that one day, right, I could get that job and, uh, and of course, be able to provide for my family. And so that was, you know, certainly one of those uh, times when I got that offer from principal. And I actually started working, I want to say uh, a week after I graduated, which in hindsight, I wish I would have taken a longer break, but yeah, no hey, problem. I was eager to, to, you know, make that money, right? But uh, uh, with that being said, Anna, going back, going back to your question, um, first of all, yes, principal has absolutely invested uh, a lot in me. And uh, as, as I maybe hopefully mentioned by now, um, I got almost a full right to, to, to go to Cornell College as well. Uh, I could, you know, I was never going to be able to afford uh, going to school, let alone a private school. Right. And so um, I would say that once I actually got those scholarship and, and that's that scholarship and that support also from principal, that made a big difference. Right. But the biggest thing, if, if we take uh, uh, another step back, Anna and, and Jamie, is that I didn't really have a lot of grow, uh, role models growing up. Right. And and that's hard because I, I tell people that you can't be what you can't see. Right. And so. Um, even though I had a lot of help from, uh, uh, you know, the people in my support system, you know, I couldn't tell you, hey, you know, I want to be the next, uh, uh, you know, Jamie Hopkins of financial services, right, or the next Ana Trujillo. And so that was that was very hard. And uh, in many ways, I tell people that I, I was a first. And with that being said, though, I also know that I'm not going to be the last. <laughs> And that's one of the reasons, Anna, that I'm involved with Alpha. Uh, I'm also on the board of Junior Achievement for uh, uh, Central Arizona. Take a lot of pride in that and helping with those financial literacy um, efforts and entrepreneurship and career readiness. Uh, uh, I also, as an entrepreneur, am a big uh, supporter of you know minority-owned businesses. Uh, my lady also owns her own uh, uh, meal prep business, and I try to support her as much as possible. Uh, and then, of course, different diversity and inclusion efforts uh, at principal as well. Uh, but with that, I would say that it's it's almost uh, uh, you know my way of, of paying back on a, and and making sure that uh, you know I'm trying to do things that not only will benefit me but will also benefit my community, uh, my family, right, our friends, uh, because I didn't really necessarily have those resources and that support system or, or maybe that role model that I wanted to have when, when I was growing up. And I'll tell you one thing. Um, I think uh, as professionals, especially full-time professionals, we, I think, sometimes underestimate, right, how much work goes into these, for example, volunteer board positions and, and so on and so forth. And so I tell people, first of all, you're not going to have the time, right? you got to make the time. And two, you got to have passion, right? Uh, you know, when it's six, seven o'clock at night and I maybe have to jump uh, into an alpha call on a... Uh, you know, I, I I sometimes question right myself sometimes, and I'm sure I'm sure my lady is also not the happiest. Uh, but you know, when we put those events together, and I see you know those those younger kids and that maybe college student that says, "Hey, you know, one day uh, you know want to be in financial services like you." That's when it all it all matters, right? I, I taught a financial literacy class when I first got involved with Junior Achievement. Uh, I had a group of about twenty students or so, and just you know, one I had a blast, right? Uh, teaching the class over, I think it was like maybe four or five weeks. Uh, but two, at the end, I actually uh, threw a, a pizza party for them, and I raised a bunch of funds, and and I actually had because my class ended in December. I had uh, a surprise raffle for them, and and we ended up getting like six or seven hundred dollars. 
uh, and donations from my colleagues. And so we had got them all Christmas gifts. And this was at a, a low income, uh, within a low income community. Most of these kids were minorities. And uh, again, to just see their happy faces, uh, you know, when, when I got done with the class and, and, you know, even the whole pizza party and everything was a surprise. And I actually took my fiance with me, I uh, heard my daughter wrap the gifts and everything. So I was able to also involve my family in that. Uh, it, it was just, you know, very rewarding for me, right? And even though, again, it, a lot of work goes into that, uh, you know, I feel like it's 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 my calling, right? And I feel like I, I need to be doing something uh, uh, along those lines uh, so that I feel like I'm, I'm actually giving back. And it's funny, I maybe share a quick story, in the uh, you know, in the interest of time here. Uh, one of my first mentors at principal, his name is Jason Neal. Um, I remember meeting with him often when I first started at, at working there. And you know, he was he was a higher up in the company. And I remember one day I asked him, I said, hey, Jason, you know, I feel like you do a lot for me. Uh, so how can I repay? Right. How can I possibly uh, reciprocate? And he kind of looked at me and he giggled. And he said, well, you know, you probably can't do much for me on a professional level. But he said, uh, just make sure that when somebody else comes to you, you do the same for them. You know, and so that's I, I always think about that because, uh, you know, certainly it's 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 uh, it's an opportunity that I don't want to miss out. That is that. a good, that's a good transition into the kind of our last question too, right? With a mentor and, uh, you know, feedback is, uh, you know, one of the things we always ask people on here too is kind of, you know, how do you want to be remembered? What's the legacy you want to la leave behind? So I don't know if you've thought about that a lot yet, but uh, you mentioned pieces of it. So I believe you have, right? And uh, you, you mentioned that it's, it was one of my favorite interviews and it was before Anna hopped on, but it wasn't because of that. But uh, Daryl <laughs> Green was like my favorite sports uh, yeah. athlete growing up. And in his episode, he talked about like he gave this story about like, you know, the football player, but he doesn't want to be remembered as that. He wants to be remembered <laughs> as the person and the things he did. And oh, yeah, by the way, he played football. Right. And I thought that was a really nice way <laughs> of saying it for like a Hall of Fame player. Right. Um, yeah, and of he's this like super humble, religious man that cares about family. And, you know, football was just a job he did. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. what is that for you? Wow. Again, what a what a question. Um, and I love these because I feel like they're they're more open ended. Right. And, and I wish I could maybe provide a more direct and succinct answer. But, you know, I would say, uh, Jamie and Anna, that I just want to be remembered for trying to be the best at everything that I ever did. Uh, my biggest pride is becoming a father. Uh, I want to be the best father that I can be for my kids. Uh, secondly, I want to, you know, be the best uh, uh, husband to my future wife that I can be. Third, I want to, you know, be the best uh, son for my parents. And then I would say everything else, at least from a professional standpoint, would come after that. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, we're very lucky to work in a in an industry when we can when we can uh, do well by doing good. Uh, and, uh, I don't take that for granted. Um, you know, and so in, in, uh, executing as far as from a professional standpoint, I want to make sure that, uh, you know, I leave a mark, uh, in the industry in, in, in terms of trying to do that, making sure that I did help, you know, our, our, uh, partners, our, our financial professionals, our clients reach those, those good outcomes that I mentioned and, and accomplish their dreams and goals, whatever those may be. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. Uh, the other thing I think about, Jamie, with with that question, and I know we didn't really have a chance to talk about this, but uh, I was born with a genetic immunodeficiency uh, called CVID, Common Variable Immunodeficiency. And, you know, long story short, it just makes me more prone to getting sick. Right. So talk about being afraid of a, a worldwide pandemic here in the night in, in the last couple of years. Right. And, and trying to be in a bubble. But um the interesting thing about that specific uh, chronic illness, Jamie and Anna, is that when I was diagnosed, uh, and this was actually in Mexico years ago, I was still a little kid. Um, I remember one of my doctors, and I was maybe seven, eight, nine years old at the time. I don't remember exactly. Uh, one of the doctors was talking to my mother at the time. And, you know, back then they knew very little about this actual disease, right? But they knew that, uh, uh, you know, the life expectancy wasn't very long for somebody with that immunodeficiency. So I remember vividly um, hearing the doctor have a conversation with my mom. And even though, of course, I couldn't understand or fully grasp everything that they were talking about, the one thing I do remember was that the doctor told my my, my mother that I wasn't going to live past my teenage years. And so um, 
that stuck with me because you know I'm now 32 years old, uh, and by the way, I beat cancer proudly uh, in June of 2016. Uh, most likely as a result of my immunodeficiency. So my perspective, Jamie and Anna, on life is probably very different than most people's, right? I, I very much value every day that I can walk uh, on this earth. And because of that, I think I also uh, make sure that everything that I do uh, has that lens, right? Has that uh, uh, perspective top of mind because who knows, right? If If I live maybe five or 10 or 50 years, but whatever those years or those days or that time frame is, I want to make sure that I, it, you know, can can look back and say, live the best life that I possibly could have lived, with the amount of right or with the time frame that I was that I was given. So, hopefully, that makes sense. No, absolutely makes sense. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing with us. <laughs> no tears, Anna, because if you no, cry, I know I'm going. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm your water. Anna. <laughs> That's it's right, right here. It's... No. <laughs> Well, Diego, thank you so much for taking time for us today. I really appreciate um, you coming on the framework and, and sharing your journey and your story with Jamie and I and all of our listeners. No, my pleasure. I think, uh, like I said, I'm in the presence of greatness here. And uh, uh, believe it or not, Jamie, you certainly have been an inspiration for me in this industry as well. And, uh, you know, having those uh, three letters after my name now and, and relating to you in that regard, uh, certainly something that I'm very proud of. And of course, Ana, you are, uh, you know, a powerhouse and a trailblazer. And as, uh. a, as a Latina in, in this industry, uh, you both of you represent the, the change that we need to, to, to see in this world, right? So thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your contributions. And I'm certainly very excited to, to follow your, your lead as well. Awesome. Well, thank you, Diego, again. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this week's episode of the Framework Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. 